We will now move over to Shamit Sagar. Sh Professor um, Shamit is the Executive Director of the Australian Centre for Student Equity and Success at Curtin University. He was also the formerly the inaugural director of the Public Policy Institute and Professor of Public Policy at the University of Western Australia. Over to you, Shamit. Uh, thank you for that. And thank you for the invitation to, to speak to this huge cast that you've, you've managed to get together. So um, well done on all the organizers. I'm delighted to be here. Um, I'm, I'm conscious time is running against us. So I'm gonna try and limit myself to that slide there. Um, and it, my sort of comments come in two or three parts, and I think they're straightforward, I, I hope. Let's see how they go. In a sense, Barney and Sally have done the heavy lifting. Barney has sort of painted a broad picture, and then Sally's gone into some of the granular detail. And there's really not much I can add or, or, or take away from that, in a sense. You know, I kind of agree with 98 or 99 percent of whatever they, they were saying. Um, but I want to start zooming in, and, and just for the benefit of the audience, I was specifically asked to sort of put my mind to an important part of the whole exercise, which is the new Australian Tertiary Education Commission, ATEC. I'll do that in a second, but I just want to build on two points to start with in order to get there. So it's a direction of travel. Sally just said it's a marathon. Use, people use words like momentum, all interchangeable. This is clearly an intergenerational thing, but we've got to get cracking. Uh, in some senses, we're already behind, given that this was sort of going on in 2008. Um, and there's lots of reasons to get our sort of, uh, in Australia, ourselves, you know, policymakers, researchers, government practitioners, um, to all put their shoulders to this wheel. So I'm entirely uh, supportive of that. So when I look at it, or when we look at the um, accord, yes, we agree with Barney's overall position. I want to reinforce this um, to the audience that out of the 47 recommendations as boiled down, guess what? All 47 of them have got something to do with equity. They're either directly or indirectly affecting things. And oftentimes, you know, number 13 is affecting number 17, which has an cumulative effect of number 23. And it tends to skew things in favor of either um, disadvantaged students or some groups of disadvantaged students. So you really, we need to really keep an eye on the whole damn thing. That's hard. So why not just sort of focus in for the time being on what I call the sort of the equity levers that are going to be in the foreground. So what I've done is I've kind of constructed what I call a six legged, -legged stool. Um, it's a weird metaphor I've kind of made up. At least it's better than a three legged stool, because if you take one leg away from a three legged stool, it falls over. In my six legged stool, if you take a, a leg away, it still stands up, hopefully. So that's kind of metaphor for um, the Accord and ATEC. To recap needs-based funding alongside the new funding regime that Barney was talking about is a big part of getting equity resolved, getting it moving. Uh, every vice chancellor tells you that they need a hypothecated, dedicated resource to do some of this stuff. And the NBF will be a good, good part of that, I think. I hope that um, depends on the exact number of dollars. Uh, but also the larger funding regime, I think, is uh, going to be important. So. Again, if we were just doing the needs-based funding and the larger funding regime was out of bounds, this would become harder. It's actually made easier by the fact that all the drains on funding and students are being pulled up at the same time. And I, I really welcome that. It means that there's a, a really good opportunity to reset this. Secondly, there's the actual dedicated ed equity programs we've got in universities. Now we've got the lion's share of people, no doubt today are equity practitioners. They're often overlooked, I think, in the discussion, because we've talked about high polluting policy and funding regime that and quota this, uh, all important. But actually, as we speak, in all 39 universities, there's an army of equity practitioners who are getting on with this. And um, I just wanted, I mean, I, don't, I guess I'm just sort of shouting out the fact that we would be a lot worse off if it were not for the fact that they're doing what they're doing. But we want to make sure that they can do more. And as you, some of you will know, the centre itself is building up, as it were, or helping to build up the capacity and the um, the uh, skills and, and so on and so forth uh, through our trials and evaluation programs. So that's an important part of, of the exercise. If we didn't have them, we'd be trying to recruit the practitioners into the programs from scratch. Thank goodness we're not. Thirdly, there's money. So the help regime is going to receive some relief. You've got some detail on that. I don't want to dwell upon that. But guess what? Money for students and how they pay it back and the way in which it's presented to them, how they think about it, is important. So it's good that we've got that within the scope. I'd be a bit worried that got lost between February and May. 
Uh, and then the larger point, and this is really, I think, where the equity starts to bite, I think, or the equitable outcomes can bite, which is what's known as moderated growth targets. So remember, Jason wants to have a doubling of the size of the HE sector. We can go into why and, and, and sort of the effects of that. But because that boat, as it were, is rising, then the key thing is to make sure that the equity part of it, students from disadvantaged backgrounds, is sort of locked in, as words. You don't want to sort of create this where that's rising and this is sort of falling further behind. I'll stop waving my arms around, but you see the point I'm making. But moderated growth targets are being very, very pointed. It's government through the ATEC, through the commission, saying we will actually have the final say as to how universities and given institutions will grow based on a variety of factors, which we can go into, but an important part of that will be your equity track record and potential. Why would you leave it out? It seems crazy. So I really welcome this big agenda to grow, which has got an equity lever sort of built in. And then lastly, ATEC. So let me just kind of switch to what I was really going to sort of focus upon, which is ATEC. I would go as far as to say to the audience, no ATEC, no accord. Uh, it's as simple as that. And I don't want to be the chicken little who's sort of saying to 1,600 people, you know, it's all it's all over. On the contrary, I think it's it's absolutely going to happen. I should make the point that building ATEC from scratch should not be underestimated. It's not a walk in the park. It's got to do all those complicated things that Barney was going on about and all those numerous things that Sally was taking us through. And it's got to hold its, its mind on all those different thoughts at the same time. This is not a walk in the park. And so it's got to be done in a very considered way, but also in a timely way. And I'm just going to sort of focus upon what I think needs to be happening in this area. It may be helpful for us to sort of think about that. So all roads lead, as I said, to the um, the uh, construction, the what I call the ATEC build exercise. Uh, it is a bureaucracy at the end of the day. It's exactly right that it's been constructed as a kind of buffer, as it were. There's a larger point that it, future education secretaries in Australia don't necessarily, including Jason, don't necessarily run the higher education system. Um, it's, there is no higher education system from Gambra's point of view. There's seven states and territory systems, which are very loosely stitched together by the Commonwealth Supported Places uh, scheme and one or two other things. It clearly isn't how other mature industrial democracies go about managing their higher education system, never mind managing growth with or for equity. So that's important. The second thing is, I think it needs a flexible approach to getting its uh, capabilities and its skills sorted out. In the jargon, um, it's a network, a capability network. Uh, and, and absolutely, we put the center that I lead at the disposal of that um, uh, exercise and getting that expertise in, in a single place. I've got the arms uh, whirring away. Uh, governance, I will skip over because it's a complicated thing, but you've already had Sally take you through the proposed governance. I've certainly got some views on that, but I'll, I'll come back to it later in, in the questions possibly. And then the last thing and the most important thing, if you're going to go to the trouble of building ATEC and, and put, hitching the Accord vision on the back of that, then frankly, um, both its executive people, the people who work in it and for it, and also its commissioners and its governance and its boards and everyone else around it, in my view, needs to have as broad an equity lens as possible. I'm always suspicious and, and sort of nervous about equity being a slice of what a big body does, however well it's done, because you can entrench the issues and become over-specialized and, and in effect miss the big policy levers that are to do with funding or research or manage growth. So I'm in favor of that broad equity lens. And there's a way of acquiring that. And if you start doing that, I think then there's capacity for ATEC in due course to become very smart and, and very sort of proactive around intersectionality, but also what I would call life chances models, you know, sort of future drivers of inequity that exist in the 2030s and 2040s. We should be aware of them now. And the last point I'd make, and it's a positive point, which is ATEC doesn't have to do this by itself. There's a vast army of regulators, commissions, think tanks, universities, practitioners who try to look at these same questions, but not in higher education. They look at them in uh, in transport, in housing, in healthcare, in financial services, and so on and so forth. So there's a shared community that ATEC can become part of, so long as it has that sort of big, broad agenda and ambition. 